biological process where both the ayahuasca experience and the scientific experience can be integrated. Yeah, I don't regard. I'm not. A, I'm not a, one of the noble savage people. I mean, I've spent too much time in the Amazon, and things go on that would curl your hair. And there are people whose idea of a hilarious joke is to toss a dog in the fire, and uh, but I think there is something to be learned. You know, I mean, you can stand off and watch somebody tossing a dog in the fire for their own amusement and say, well, look, these people are barbarians. On the other hand, uh, we carpet bomb Asian cities from 30,000 feet in the air. And in the name of policy, we don't even call it fun. We're so alienated from uh, what we're doing. So, you know, what to make of it? Good so. point. <laughs> There are a couple things that interest me, and they follow very nicely on this. <laughs> One is that I would like to hear you talk very briefly, perhaps, about the highlights of what you've called the invisible landscape. What are some of the things that stand out in that? Uh, and the other is that I get the impression that you have a very distinct idea of where we, of the direction in which we can evolve. Uh, and I wonder if you would say something about that direction, and perhaps those two topics uh, sort of converge. Well, without trying to um, solve the problem once and forever, let's just say man has a very strong Gnostic bent, and you know Gnosticism, dualism. The idea that you don't belong where you are, that you belong somewhere else, that this is not your world, that you're a stranger in it, is uh, symptomatic in modern parlance of what's called alienation. You're supposed to like where you are. You're supposed to see yourself as part of the seamless fabric of being and that sort of thing. However, the people who take that position, that, that alienation is symptomatic of neurosis, don't realize that the cultural momentum of the last 500 years has made the Gnostic myth a reality. In other words, we have become a menace not only to ourselves but to the planet. And the only way that both parties can uh, save themselves is by a separation. And this, on one level, is the greatest uh, crisis that biology has faced since animals left the ocean for the land. On another level, it appears inevitable in the present social context that we are going to go to space. But we are, uh, the birth pangs of doing this are very destructive. For instance, and I'm sure you've heard me say this, that civilization is a 10,000-year dash to space with the potential to destroy yourselves. We, history is the departure of a species for the stars, but it takes 10 to 15,000 years, a moment of biological and geological time. But in that 10 to 15,000-year period, if you happen to be unlucky enough to be born somewhere in there, it's going to look like it's all up for grabs. We are creatures of information and the imagination. The monkey, we are already beginning to transform and shed. We don't look like the other monkeys, and we look less like them all the time. We are humanness, may not even be a monkey quality. It may be something that was synergized in the monkeys, but that is taking that has an inner life of its own. In other words, we, since the early 1950s, have had a notion of the structure of DNA and this sort of thing. Well, it's perfectly obvious that within a century of the discovery of DNA, any species which makes that discovery takes possession of its own form. And we are going to do that in the next 50 years. We are going to design the, we are going to design the kind of people that we want to be. And if we don't want to be people, we will design that out of the picture. I think of the picture that the mushroom has 
of the human species is much more like a coral reef. In other words, it sees our artifactria as contiguous with our flesh. We make a distinction. But what it sees is uh, an animal which takes in raw material and excretes it in ideological molds. That's what we do. We turn ideas into facts on all levels. And this cannot go on any longer on the surface of the planet with the levels of energy and control that we have brought to bear because we are now in a position to destroy the whole earth or to sculpt, to turn it into a Disneyland, which is a kind of destroying of the earth. So we have become a toxic force in planetary biology. We feel it and the planet feels it. What must happen is there has to be a cleavage and it a birth is a good metaphor because uh, uh, an infant being born can hardly uh, face the experience with anything other than trepidation, the weightless state, the effortless nurturing, the complete immersion in a support system. All that is ending in earthquakes and spasms and pain and anguish, which looks, it must look like a death process. And yet it's a life process. It is necessary for the mother and the child that this cleavage take place. And this is now happening uh, on a mass cultural level for us. We, to be who we want to be, we have to leave the planet. It, as Joyce says in Finnegan's Wake, up niant, prospector, you sprout all your worth and woof your wings. Then could you say that uh, all of the higher forms are in all of the lower forms simultaneously? Uh, yes, what's the word for that? Uh, uh, implicate. They are implicate in the lower forms. That's right. But uh, I don't know. It's a, it's, a great, uh, it's a great challenge to us to fulfill the things that we can imagine we are capable of. Our imagination is really the sail of the soul. And the question is, you know, where will that sail take us if we will but let it? Well, what is the imagination, or what is its relationship to the unconscious from which you spoke? Well, its relationship to the unconscious, I suppose it is the unconscious made conscious. In other words, uh, all, all the mythologies... Uh, I think it's Mersiliad in Mysteries and Mysteries. He talks about the evolution of human flight and says, it talks about first about shamanic flight and then the notion of the dirigible and the right flyer and the spaceship. And he says these uh, ontologically self-transforming images of flight say far more about the nature of the human soul than they do about technology. This is, again, this idea of James Joyce's that man would become dirigible. Uh, I haven't mentioned the flying saucer here this morning, but this is one of the things that I think is very interesting. I think flying saucers have been the province of very dubious intellectual cadres for probably long enough, and that it really should be looked at as a totality symbol which haunts human history in the same way that Alfred North Whitehead thought that the color dove gray haunted human history. In other words, it's a, it's a thing always present. It is the symbol of the ontological transformation of the human species and it always takes upon itself the, um, the accoutrements of the current cultural myth so that it can be seen as the intercession of the Immaculate Conception or the um, descent of an angel, or the, the current myth is that there are probably advanced civilizations somewhere in the universe, and so that this is what it is. It's really nothing so trivial, you know? It is the alchemical object. It is uh, the blind spot in the, uh, in the consciousness of the race, and it has to be the blind spot because it is a mystery. All appetition for the future is an appetition for this uh, modality of super freedom that comes 
from transcending the limitations of dimension. That's why we have, that's why our, we are so riddled with apocalyptic mythology, because we really do have a prescience about what is going to happen to us. We really do sense at a very deep level that the linear extrapolation of our historical and cultural tendencies does not give a true picture of the future, that the major factor which will shape the future is uncertainty, and that we have never yet created a method for integrating that uncertainty and planning, or planning for it. Novelty is the thing that continually overturns all efforts to uh, project toward a given end state. Mm -hmm. So is it correct to say then that our evolution will be, or can be seen as a reclaiming more of the landscape of the unconscious? Yes, absolutely. That's what it is. That is our world. Our world is in our minds. You know, the kingdom of God is within you. That's the wrath. But the point is then... <coughs> You know, to get a lease nailed down somewhere in the world of the imagination so that you can be part of it. Yes, the planet is simply a, a precursor of what we will project outward when we have the ability to do so. And this is coming soon. How um, can we, um, uh, how do you propose to accelerate the evolution of language? I think that we have to make a very reasoned case to the establishment that the um, that the psychedelic drugs have to be looked at in a non-hysterical manner by experts, and we don't know who the experts are. They may not be pharmacologists. They may turn out to be linguists, or they may turn out to be jugglers. But we have to recognize that what we're talking about when we're talking about the advancement of human evolution is the evolution of the human mind uh, and these drugs and do it you know before the argument was whether it should be called a hallucinogen or a psychedelic or an entheogen or, they were just called consciousness expanding drugs and that really as a phenomenological description is more useful than these other things they expand consciousness. Well, therefore, we should be really bearing down on them because the problem is we don't have enough consciousness mm -hmm. and we don't know how to direct it and sculpt it and orient it toward our own salvation. So we can't just take our mental states as given, as somehow sacrosanct and therefore not to be tampered with we have to actually begin to engineer them. And Arthur Kessler has made this point, this is not big news, but uh, there's some resistance to it. Again, I think a, a, a recursion of dualism in a more dangerous form, the dualism of the natural and the unnatural, <coughs> yoga is natural, drugs are unnatural, all these dichotomies, I mean, who can argue with the notion that dualism is the root of all evil? <laughs> um, How could it be otherwise? <laughs> um, a question relating to this is that there's something, we have all this choice, we have all this power, and yet we are also prone to a great many powerful mistakes. And there's the element of that which happens spontaneously through us. And this is part of that dichotomy too. Where do we leave off engineering and, and let let um, that which is beyond us do it through? You mean the thing which is leading? Yeah. Well, we need to open a more coherent dialogue with the thing which is leading. Again, the re the reason I don't. I am somewhat immune to political anxiety and that sort of thing is because I really do believe there is a control system that is larger than any human <coughs> institution. I don't believe that the evolution of fate on this planet is in the hands of the Communist Party, the Catholic Church, the Jews, Wall Street. It isn't in no one. 
is in charge. What is in charge is the most intelligent life form on the planet, which happens to be transhuman, not human. We have had for some time now the concept of uh, the collective unconscious, but we need now to think in terms of the collective consciousness of the race, which is not passive. It's not just the storage place of old memories and myths and that kind of thing. It is more like an intellect. It guides. It opens avenues to certain choices and precludes avenues to other choices. You know, I think it was in Mysterium Communiones that Jung said uh, the unconscious has a thousand ways of terminating a life that has become meaningless. A chilling notion. And what he meant was, you know, you'll step off a curb and be hit by a bus because you didn't look. But the real analysis is that a decision had been made at a higher control level to just fling you away. Well, how much more disturbing it is to think that that could be possible on a global mm -hmm. level. So we have to open a dialogue and no longer, you know, all these words, intuition, artistic vision, trance, uh, means like poetry. These are all ways of trying to have a dialogue with the control mechanism. And the psychedelic drugs, especially psilocybin, I think lay that open. We need to have professional facilitators of dialogue. We need to understand who is speaking. We only now have possibilities, you know, that the voice that speaks on psilocybin is an out and out extraterrestrial you know, with, a, with its own history, its own evolutionary standards, etc., that it is what Jung would call an autonomous portion of the psyche that has slipped beyond the ego's control, meaning that you're crazy, or at least that you are experiencing a form of consciousness not validated by this society. Um, I, I want to stick something in there. Yeah. I agree with your analysis, but I don't share the same faith that we will inevitably make it as a species, because what I see happening in the collective conscious unconsciousness, or that unconscious becoming conscious, is a, a struggle over whether to live or to die. And although I believe and uh, hope certainly it, it decides or we decide for life, I don't see that as inevitable. Well, this is the question, is God mad? You know, are we living in a universe run by a mad god where the choice for death could be made as easily as the choice for life? This is what the Gnostics of the Hellenistic this era quite feared. What I'm saying, though, really, because I think the, yeah, a subordinate consciousness was made up of all of us. So our individual decisions and consciousness, I don't think, are irrelevant to the totality. Well, is it built up of, is it, an, is it a bottom up thing or a top down I thing? I think it's a both. I don't see how, in, in this level of talking about it, you can really separate out all the elements. I um, mean, if you talk about cells in your body, uh, yeah, they don't go off into the life of their own. It's all coordinated, but it isn't coordinated by one thing in the body. The whole body coordinates itself, and each cell is part of that coordination. And you see the same thing. Yes, that's right. Yes, I see what you're saying. How do we find a local oh, Iowa girl? <laughs> These are not the ones. Well, I'll tell you. Uh, <laughs> a few years ago, we bought uh, ten acres in Hawaii and moved as many of these Peruvian drug plants as we could get uh, in there. So that was four or five years ago. Now those plants are grown, and hopefully the next time we go back to Hawaii, we'll be able to produce ayahuasca. We're calling it Hawaiiwaska. <laughs> Other than that, I don't know what to tell you. These things, the botanists don't think in terms of live plants. They always make voucher specimens. So we were, in 1982 or 1, whenever it was, we were really the first expedition looking at Amazonian psychobotany that really put emphasis on live plants. And we got out hundreds of them, you know. But then growing them, they can only be grown in greenhouses or in a subtropical environment. But eventually we're hoping that uh, researchers who need 
who want to grow the plants can buy stock from a place like that and not have the expense of having to send an, an expedition to the Amazon. I find it hard to grow the Shamanic Institute in Ecuador. Um, it was just an interesting idea and we were passing back and forth. Well, when we originally conceived this idea of a psychobotanical farm, we bought land uh, near Florencia in the state of Caquetá in Colombia. And then it became politically unfriendly to foreign scientists, and, and so we stayed away for years. And then I just read last week, 13 tons of cocaine was busted in Colombia, and it was all in Caquetá. So I assume it'll be years before it's <coughs> cooled down enough to do it there. And I like the idea of doing it in Hawaii. It, the Amazon is so difficult an environment to carry out even minimal field studies in that it's very hard to do much other than interview the informants, collect the vouchers, collect the drugs, and get out. Because after two or three weeks you're really beginning to show the strain. I mean, it's hard to sleep in hammocks, so you go into a kind of never asleep, never awake, and the strange diet, the intestinal problems, insect toxins. Uh, people are not always 100% cooperative and honest. Um, <laughs> numerous problems. And since we were not ethnographers or anthropologists per se, our real focus was on the plants and the drugs. So hopefully in Hawaii, a more uh, commodious and low-key atmosphere can be created for experimenting with these things. <coughs> this relates to your question, which is how can, an exper how can a group of people create an experimental context for doing these drugs with an eye toward making some kind of progress or, or getting something out of it. And it's a real challenge. We were amazed when we went to Peru and began taking ayahuasca. We had never taken drugs with groups of 30 people, you know. We had either taken them uh, alone or one or two people or occasionally with 100,000 other people at a rock concert. But the notion of 30 or 40, it's very intense. And without a tradition, uh, it will be even more demanding. But it's important to do. The whole problem in psychedelic research is the um, reluctance to have human subjects in the picture. You know, as soon as that begins happening, the institutions and the government and people's wish to make careers rather than to actually do original work. A whole bunch of factors come into play that make it very, very frustrating. And yet the LD50 in rats, the absolute structural determinations, the botany, the chemistry, the linguistic studies, you can only go so far with this stuff. The real thing is what does it do? I think that's partly because in science and um, human experience is considered a valid subject of study. So, that's <laughs> what you know, it, so people don't ask those questions because, well, you can't quantitate it when you can. That's right. So, well, why don't you get both and get the mental health ground to do it? Well, I think this is Dennis's notion. Yes. What, what he wants to do, really, and I think he has Frank Barr interested and in some other people, is return one more time at least to the Amazon and study them taking it and actually take blood samples and study diet and get a, re a full biomedical study of what's going on. And that should be sufficient data then that you could, could get a grant for human experimentation in this country. All this remains to be done. The, the, the work is just beginning to be done on psychedelics. Essentially, the botany is now well in hand. There are only botanical details now, but the chemistry, the pharmacology, the neurophysiology, the psychology, these are just wide open areas. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you for uh, doing what you're doing. Yeah, I, I can't remember since sitting like this in India. 
being so enlivened by what's going on today. Oh, thank you very much. (laughs) I would like to hear from some of you who have been so silent. (laughs) People who have are either appalled that we're this meeting today. Um, let me preface the question. Uh, um, from my own meditative experience, I feel like I'm just beginning to get to a point where I can feel how energy and stillness are both necessary. And in like the existential phenomenological sense, they co-constitute one another. It cannot be one without the other. And by energy, I mean all its forms too, including mind. As you, uh, for me, it was good to hear another way of saying that mind, the idea of mindfulness or chitta in the yoga philosophy, that is a reality to someone else too. Mm-hmm. It's comforting, um, including the intellectual stuff, all that form. In your experience with these cultures, these different cultures, is there a I hear a lot about the energy side, the form, etc. Is there any stillness work? Is there any uh, is stillness sacred? Is there is there a meditative quote unquote tradition or one guy in this culture? culture? Oh yeah, I, for sure. Me, I, yes, like, no. it doesn't call itself that. It calls itself trance. But trance is is not a state of unconsciousness. It's in fact a state of full alertness, but you can't move. And you don't experience this as paralysis because you don't care to move. But yes, I think that you that there must be stillness for these things to manifest. One of the most puzzling things about psychedelic drugs is trying to teach people how to invoke the modality People have the attitude toward drugs that uh, if you take them, they will work. And this is not true at all, especially with drugs where a modality like mind is what you're attempting to conjure. So that, you know, a, a drug will potentiate you for a vision state, but a number of other things have to be present, energy and stillness being, I think, the two most important ones. And then a third factor, which is uh, the invocation. You must invoke it in some way, and it's hard to explain what that is. It's sort of like, you know, the, it, it, the difference between being alone and with someone. You, Though you are alone taking the drug, you have to assume the I-thou tension, and then you will discover the thou on the other end of the equation. And so the stilling will allow this. Um, It's almost um, sensory deprivation is what's required, not in the formal sense of a tank or anything like that, but you must sit still in darkness, and you must look at your closed eyelids with the expectation of seeing something, and then you will. Within the culture, a spoken discipline about mental stillness and the importance of that, or talking about the, the drugs or plants in terms that that would be a positive thing, or I'm just curious. I think that the, the, the context is isolation. That's what they would say about this. They say, well, we go into isolation. We put ourselves away. We put ourselves into a tree or a cut, a cult hut or something like that and do not move around a lot. I think it's a well, this question, though, of the role of hallucinogens in, in Taoist practice is not, to, not well understood. If you know James Ware's book, the number, the attention given to fungi is out of all proportion. I mean, their pharmacopoeia was <clears throat> largely fungal. Uh, the, there are no known psilocybin mushrooms from China reported. However, this is a place for somebody to make a quick reputation, I bet. Uh, If you chose carefully where you went to look, 
I'll bet you would find it because we know Stepheri cubensis is in Thailand, Laos, and there is no reason at all that it shouldn't be in southern China. And it was in southern China that the Taoist pharmacopoeia was evolved and elaborated. Tony Art. Strickman's working on it. He wrote a couple of papers. Strickman. Strickman. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes, he's doing very interesting work in all of this. I think that uh, hallucinogens are basic to humanness and always have been. You know, Carl Ruck and Wasson wrote a very convincing book to show that the Eleusinian mysteries were an ergot, a cult of ergot intoxication. I thought that sounded co totally crazy before I read the book. I thought that it was going to be some flung-together case that would convince nobody. Actually, <coughs> I can't believe that it's anything else. Having read the book, the evidence is overwhelming. Well, Eleusis was the central wellspring of mystery for the Western mind for 2,000 years. Everybody who was anybody went to Eleusis and had the experience. And uh, there were times when the mystery was profaned to the point that uh, writers can speak of wealthy Athenians who had the mystery in their house, were able to offer it to their guests, uh, after dinner. Well, what kind of mystery is this? And um, John Allegro wrote a much less convincing book, uh, The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, trying to say that Christianity itself was a mushroom cult. In fact, going much further oh, yeah. than that, saying that Christ himself was, in fact, no person at all but a code, a system of coded epigrams for a mushroom. His case is harder to judge because it depends on a knowledge of, uh, of Aramaic philology. But uh, my brother has suggested to me, and in fact has uh, set an outline for a book, he believes that consciousness itself arose in the higher primates in a feedback relationship with hallucinogenic plants. In other words, he would go much further than Wasson, who's saying religion was caused by a relation. He's saying thought itself was caused by monkeys relating to these plants. And we know from laboratory experiments that if you set uh, monkeys in a situation where they can uh, smoke DMT by just walking up to a, a pipette and taking a hit, that 20% of the monkeys will refuse food and water in preference to that. Well, now, so, so yes, that's us. We'd rather be stoned. And so having this predilection, apparently it's simply the shift is what they like. They like the thrill, the shift of modality from down to up and up to down. But you stretch that out over a hundred thousand years, and the next thing you know, you have the integral calculus and the 384-byte chip and all the rest of it. So it may be that humanness is a symbiotic relationship between certain plants and certain monkeys, and that you don't have humanness unless you have the plants and the monkeys together. This is why we may be the heirs of an inhuman culture. In in Colombia, once I saw a graffiti, and it, on my Spanish I can't get it right. But what it was, there was a picture of a mushroom, and it said, "Without this, you are not yourself." <laughs> 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 so this is, a, you know, Arthur Kessler. I think it was in the Ghost in the Machine, said very clearly that he felt there was no hope for the human species without chemical intervention that we cannot be the sharp-fanged monkey and the possessor of atomic weapons, and that we're going to have to chemically intervene to mute the monkey, uh, the monkey proclivities. And uh, it may be true that the, the depth of their influence upon us, our thought systems, language, I hold the, the 
peculiar opinion that language preceded meaning by millennia, that long before people could communicate, they discovered how interesting the small mouth noises were and made them for each other as a form of entertainment, which then bifurcated into chanting and singing. But it was very late in this experimenting with small mouth noises that someone got the idea that you could assign a meaning to a certain mouth noise, and everybody would agree that that's what that noise meant, and then you could discuss things. So, you know, we are creatures of language and thought, and uh, probably because these drugs, these plants, first kicked that over in us. I'd like to go back to the drugs and consciousness <laughs> idea. <laughs> I'm just stop right there for a minute. Um, are you... I mean, there's several ways that a person could take that notion, really, in several different directions that you can go in with it. On the one hand, the, you could be suggesting that the experience itself of a hallucinatory state is such a um, uh, different experience from normal waking consciousness that it demands thought to come to terms with it. And I don't think that's a very tenable line because the dream state itself <coughs> would have a similar experience as we know that chimpanzees and lower primates are dreaming, so that doesn't seem to be too far. Um, the other way would be to say it's the actual communication with more developed intelligence that is inducing thought in our species, the way we're doing that now with chimpanzees and teaching them sign language. And they're starting to develop humor and things mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. If you want to go that way too, then you have to then get to how did that being itself develop consciousness and start to I mean, it's an interesting line, but I don't think it's it would stop there. Well, wondering where you want it to. The way I think of it is a, a third possibility, a kind of a geometric model, which is just to say, here you have a grid called experience of the world, and then we have waking, so that's a dot on the grid. Then we have dreaming, that's another dot on the grid. But you can't construct a three-dimensional reality till you have a third dot. And this is what the psychedelic experience is providing. It's providing a reference point for the production of new metaphor. Mm. So that it isn't really, it isn't, and you really notice this with acid, it isn't the taking of LSD that is so important. It's the talking about it. <laughs> but having, in other words, the reference point. Remember when we were all freaks and all we talked about was how, uh, how in the light of acid everything was thus and so and thus and so and thus and so. And it took about five years, longer for some of us, <laughs> uh, to assimilate that. So we no longer had to run around saying how everything was in the light of LSD. We had integrated that point on the grid and I think that's what it is is we tap into worlds of experience and each world of experience taps uh, stretches our metaphors is a boot in the tail for further evolution of language and that's all the evolution we have now I said this earlier but it's a point worth making again it isn't culture that's changing and carrying everything with it it's language that's changing, and it carries culture with it. Culture lags far behind. But the evolution of language is the evolution of reality. I mean, this is a cliché, but we, the challenge of the cliché is to make it operational. Mm -hmm. So that like God, when you utter a word, it becomes so, you know. Um, do you see, what, what do you reflect on in terms of the origins of the use of, of hallucinogens and that whole, you know, scheme, sort of the negative, or the, you know, the, the literally the, we were you talking a great deal about the sort of evolutionary potentials, and I'm curious about, you know, the example negative of the potentials, yeah, negative potentials, and how we deal with those and foresee them. Well, uh, the only answer I can give is uh, probably not a very good one. The forces of, uh, let me put it a different way, the government gets to everything first. And they have been at the problem you ask for 20 years with an amazing little success. I worked for the Department of Interior for a while, I can tell you why. <laughs> well, there are many reasons why, but it doesn't seem very pervertible. They were very excited 
at first, you know. But then, and I think what they got into, although perhaps you can say more about this because you probably follow the literature, they like to give the psychedelic drugs to people and then hypnotize them and then get them to do terrible things which they wouldn't remember later. And claims were made that this was possible or being done, but it certainly didn't seem to come into wide application. They also looked at, during the Vietnam War, they want, they built artillery shells, which would deliver aerosol DMT. Uh, they envisioned uh, dropping one of these aerosol DMT bombs uh, on a Vietnamese town. Everyone falling into this intense hallucinogenic state and they could just roll right in. But like plans uh, in the 1960s, radicals, uh, there was uh, the fantasy of poisoning water supplies with LSD. Well, it just turns out that there are chemical factors and buffering problems, and it just is not very easy to do these things. I suppose maybe I'm too sanguine about it, and irrationally so, because when I ask this question of the mushroom entity, the perversion of this, yeah, I was told uh, that it was good in such a platonic sense that you could only approach it if you were good, so that it was like ethical mercury, <laughs> the grasping hand, <laughs> you find that it flowed right through it, and there was nothing left. But I may be God's fool, you know, that may be any <laughs> Certainly we know the Nazis uh, used scopolamine as a truth serum, although now when you look at the down scopolamine, it's not very impressive. People don't, they lie as much as they tell the truth, so it's a little puzzling as to why. Uh, yeah. But it, it, definitely, uh, it's the truth, yeah. that's it's right, the that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, James called the cognitive imperative that he's happy because he believes. Yeah, that's right. And so a lot of the use of all these things may depend a great deal on what people believe. And also, technology is the production, is the you could think of it as the residue of the workings of the imagination, and the imagination is not is under the control of the the superego or the overmind, so that I think technology has a weird way of always escaping the intentions of uh, those who are working with it. A perfect example would be the the chip which makes possible the personal computer. That thing was developed under contract to the Air Force by, I think, Sperry Rand, and when it was finally finished, it didn't work right. It was far too slow. They wanted it for guidance systems of missiles and this kind of thing. So this thing is a thousand times too slow. It's just baloney. It's worthless. Toss it in the wastebasket. But somebody said, but wait a minute. You know what you could do with this? <laughs> and created, you know, an information revolution that must be absolutely appalling to the forces that wish to control. I have an Apple II computer and a $350 modem, and uh, I can access the uh, Defense Department databases. I can access uh, all uh, the complete shelf list of the Library of Congress, all chemical abstracts, in short, all information in the world. I can access from my living room in Sonoma County, and so can anyone else who buys a thousand dollars worth of equipment. This was not part of the plan. <laughs> this is in fact a terrifying uh, thing. And oh my God, these computer networks, where, as an example, a few years ago, someone invented a device. This is an anecdote that will give you the idea. Someone invented a little device which looked like a ballpoint pen. And it was a small cybernetic device that could be programmed with a category, like, let's say, stamp collector or sadomasochist. <laughs> and when you wore this pen, if you got near anyone else who was wearing a similar device programmed with the same word, 
your pen would begin flashing a little light. <laughs> the notion was that these things could be sold to people who hang out in singles bars and would create a dimension neither public nor private, a new dimension where people of similar interests could get together completely. So isn't, isn't that interesting? And this thing had a range of 20 feet. Okay. <laughs> so now comes the thousand dollars worth of cybernetic equipment and the telephone, and it's the same device. It doesn't clip into your shirt pocket, but we've extended the range to include the entire planet. Well, you can have a uh, search program on it too. Oh, you do. You go into these. You go into these computer networks, and you say, you know, who listed? Who listed that they were interested in mushrooms, psychedelics, psilocybin, consciousness-altering drugs, hallucinogens? And then, out of seventy thousand users on the network, in four and a half seconds. It tells you that 12 people listed one or some of those words. You immediately type a little letter to each one, shoot it off through the system, and you're in contact with those people. This makes conspiracy <laughs> on, on a level almost impossible to conceive, a form of liberation. And uh, these kinds of hardwired technologies are simply patriarchal um, follow-ons to the feminizing of consciousness that is happening in drugs. In other words, the, the you can almost think of uh, drugs as the software and cybernetics as the hardware of what is being done. But vast areas are being opened up for human interaction completely unregulated by any kind of institution, and these will create new kinds of social realities. And the computer has a psychedelic experience. <laughs> it is a psychedelic, uh, it, it's a hardwired psychedelic experience. You are, people think, uh, tend to think of computers as masculine, I guess, because uh, uh, the first generation of people who built them were male, but what they actually are are the mysterious mama matrix of information. It is like the unconscious made conscious. The unconscious is ceasing to be <laughs> unconscious. All information is rising into this dimension of accessibility so that you need not wonder how many people died of tuberculosis in western Nepal last year? You just key into the biomedical index and you find out. So, and, and this seems to me, you know, the word psychedelic has been uh, attached to the drugs and confined, but many things are psychedelic. Anything which expands, adumbrates, aids, and... Uh, and supports consciousness is psychedelic if we take the word down to its uh, Greek roots. So this is uh, this is very exciting.